Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could somehow compress any graph, any arbitrary large complicated graph into a tiny, tiny graph and just analyze that graph instead? That would be, that sounds almost impossible, but it is in some sense possible. So let me try to formulate what I mean by compressing a graph. Um, let me denote, so let, let vi denote um, the vertices of the compressed graph g, g naught and let v capital VI be the pre-image of that. So the, the vertices that are compressed. So this cluster of vertices V1 in the original graph are those vertices that are, th that are mapped to the vertex V1 in the compressed graph. So consider, for example, uh, the pair of clusters, the pair of pre-images V1 and V5. Now there's a huge bipartite graph between them. I'm going to compress this entire bipartite graph into a single number the density of that bipartite graph. The density is simply the normalized number of edges there. So that's the number of edges between V1 and V5 divided by the maximum possible number of edges, which is the size of V1 times the size of V5. So, uh, and in the compressed graph, I would write 0 0.3 on the edge connecting V1 and V5. So eventually I would get a weighted, so the compressed graph would be a weighted graph on just five vertices. And so the question is, uh, when does compressing a whole bipartite graph into a single number make sense? So it makes sense, for example, if this graph is random. If it's the, if it's the random graph of density 0 0.3, then, it, that, then, then this really makes perfect sense because if you take now arbitrarily large enough subsets of V1 and V5, really completely arbitrary subsets of V1 and subsets of V1 and the subset of V5, and consider the density between those subsets, what would be the density? It's going to be 0 0.3 plus minus some error, small error epsilon. Okay, that's the property of, of random graphs. Uh, and more generally, we call any graph satisfying this property with the error epsilon, we call it epsilon regular or epsilon quasi-random graph. So any graph which is epsilon regular with density 0 0.3, it makes sense to think of it, like the whole essence of it is basically encompassed by a single number. Uh, so this line of reasoning basically says that now you do this for every pair of um, vertices in the compressed graph and this compressed graph, so I, I basically fully defined the compressed graph. Now it makes sense to do that, to compress the graph this way if the original graph was indeed a union of epsilon regular bipartite graphs. Then it makes sense, otherwise I have no idea. Uh, but of course not every graph is of this form, a union of epsilon regular graphs. Well, in fact, it almost is. So that's enter the enter semi-redis regular dilemma, one of the most important results in graph theory. And it has many applications also in computer science, number theory, and so much more. Uh, here's the formal statement uh, proved by Andrew Semered in 78. It says the following, for every parameter epsilon and every graph whatsoever, you can partition its vertex set into a number of equal parts which is independent of the original number of vertices. It's only, it, this number, f of epsilon, only depends on that parameter epsilon, <coughs> uh, such that almost all those class pairs of clusters, the bipartite graph between them is random-like, is epsilon regular. Um, so you really get, you always get this image. Every graph looks like that. Every graph has a small model. Really, every graph. That's that's an amazing uh, uh, idea, an amazing result, and uh, assuming that you are allowing almost all pairs. So not all pairs are are epsilon regular, but almost all of them. So why is this small model useful to us? So for example, you can argue about just by looking at this small model, you can argue about subgraphs that are contained in the original graph. So fix any small configuration, any small subgraph age. So for example, age can be a the, the triangle, the triangle graph. So three vertices where every two pair of vertices, the two vertices are connected by an edge. So if you want to count the number of triangles uh, in the in your original huge graph G, you can just do that on the compressed graph instead. And that number normalized is the same as, like the, the triangle density in the compressed graph is the same as the triangle density in the original graph, plus minus some error, which is depending on, dependent only on epsilon. Uh, so, yeah, let me mention two applications in number theory. 
Um, so there's the famous semi-ready, the same semi-ready, but you, that is a statement about arithmetic progressions. So it says that it's a very famous statement. It says the result. It says that every dense subset of the first n integers, assuming n is sufficiently large, contains a k term arithmetic progression for any constant for any fixed k. And the case of k equals three, so three term arithmetic progressions. The statement that three terms, three term arithmetic progressions are unavoidable in large enough sets. It, uh, it was proved by Roth in the 50s, uh, and it's a number theoretical statement. It was proved using number theoretic arguments, Fourier theoretic arguments. But in fact, it is true for more fundamental reasons. It's true for combinatorial reasons. And it follows from the graph regularity lemma. Um, in fact, what follows from the graph regularity lemma is the case k equals three, but the general case for uh, k term arithmetic progressions for any k, for that you need a regularity lemma for hypergraphs. So what is a hypergraph? It's just a natural extension of graphs where in a graph, every edge consists of two vertices, connects two vertices. In a k graph, every edge consists of k vertices. vertices. Uh, but as, as usually happens, things get complicated once you move to uh, hypergraphs. But once you have a hypergraph regularity lemma, then this uh, famous theorem follows uh, quite easily. And the, the and Semerides proof from 74 is insanely complicated. So, so you really want a combinatorial, relatively nice proof for that. Uh, and in fact, if you have the, uh, the hypergraph regularity lemma, then you can actually deduce something much stronger than multidimensional Semerides theorem. I won't even go to the definition, to the, the, the exact statement, but it basically says that you can get arbitrary uh, uh, configurations in, in high dimensional space or in high dimensional grids. Uh, it, it's a vast, vast generalization of, of uh, similar theorem on, on arithmetic progressions, but the original proof of that uh, used ergodic, uses ergodic theorem and a theory and it relies on the axiom of choice and so it doesn't give any bounds on, on n, uh, any finite bounds. And the only proof that gives finite bounds that we know of today is, is the one using the hypergraph regularity lemma. I've often heard that say that, 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 doesn't use the axiom of choice or? I, I suppose we just want to make some sort of introduction to the axiom, <coughs> to the algorithmic side of it, what we do. And that is the point of that. Anyway, I'll end asking and you can do that. Okay. Well, uh, n apparently no one knows. Um, but you do, we do know some bounds that you get. It's the same bounds that you get from the hypergraph regularity. And I'm specifically, what are these bounds? It, it, the, the bounds are inherited from the from the number from the bound on the number of uh, vertices in the compressed model, the compressed hypergraph. Okay, so what what I called um, f of epsilon for the graph regularity lemma. So we have f your f of epsilon sub k uh, for the k graph regularity lemma, and that once you have that, you immediately get the bound for the multidimensional similarity theorem. Um, so it's important to understand what is the best possible, how, how small can we get the compressed graph to be or <laughs> compressed hypergraph to be. So actually there is not one hypergraph regularity lemma, there are several. Um, there are several non-equivalent ways to define it. Actually several groups of research came up with different notions of hypergraph regularity. Some of them are combinatorial, some of them analytic, some of them combinatorial, uh, sorry, probabilistic. But, but there is something, one thing that is common to all of those proof is that the bound that they give on the number of parts in the, in the compressed hypergraph is given by the kth Ackermann function. So what are, what are, what are the Ackermann functions? It's a, it's a family of functions. The first Ackermann function is simply the exponential function. So two times two times, two, so two to the n. The second Ackermann function is the iteration of that. So two to the two to the two to the two n times. That's also called the tower function. Uh, the third Ackermann function is the tower whose height is a tower, whose height is a tower, whose height is a tower, etc. And that, that is called quite appropriately the Walser function. And, and in general, the, the bounds that you get in all of these proofs are Ackermann sub k of something like one over epsilon. All of them gain basically the same bound, even though the proofs are quite different. 
Uh, and so let's talk about lower bounds now. Uh, for many years, people have been trying to um, improve Semered's original bounds for the graph regularity lemma. And, and they all failed. And Tim Gauss in 97, in a famous result, showed that there was a good reason they failed. You can't improve over the tower bound that you get from Semered's original proof. Uh, the origi so Tim's proof was, was quite involved. And it actually, in the laudation to, to his Fields medal, this proof was, was uh, referred to as a tour de force. But, but actually, there is an alternative uh, two-page proof. Uh, which is still very clever, very nice, but, but it's readable. Um, okay, and, and people in this area conjecture that, uh, I think it's a folklore conjecture, that the, 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 the correct bound for k-graph regularity is the kth Ackermann function. So you can't improve the upper bounds that, that everyone gave. There's no new improved, like a new proof of the k-graph regularity lemma that would give significantly better bounds. People have been trying to prove this prediction of Terence Tau and others, and they all failed. And, and there was a go good reason. There was a natural barrier there. There was a reason why they all failed. I won't go into that, but uh, I will say that together with my PhD advisor, Asaf Shapiro, we were able to prove that. Uh, in fact, our proof applies to a notion of, new notion of hypergraph regularity, which is uh, m significantly, significantly weaker than all other notions. Uh, so in particular, if you prove our lower bound, you, you basically immediately get lower bound for all, automatically for all other notions. Um, but in fact, it's, it's so much weaker that it's not useful. So you can't even use it to prove a counting lemma. You can't even deduce from our notion of hypergraph regularity any of the applications that I mentioned before. And still, we, we can prove lower bounds, Ackerman, like the correct bound, lower bounds for that. And and also, this notion is, is quite simpler, simple uh, in that, in, well, it's much simpler than, than all the other notions. I won't get into that. There's very little to do with, hy with hypergraphs. And, and uh, this uh, brings up an open question. Uh, can you prove, can you come up with a different notion of, of hypergraph regularity, which, is, which has better bounds, which has bounds with, that are better than uh, the, uh, the Ackermann function bounds? But it, it is useful that you, you do have a counting lemma for it, and you can, you can prove all those implications. So that could be very significant. And now I promise that I will also mention some other external results. So if, if you didn't follow so far, that's fine. Here, here are two uh, other results uh, that are completely self-contained. Um, perhaps some of you would be able to use them in your research, hopefully. Uh, here, is a, here is a recent result um, by uh, um, in, in joint work with uh, Alon and Solomon, it talks about projections of vectors. So it turns out that if uh, you have a set of n binary vectors, each of length n, and you uh, project them onto k coordinates. So you can think of this setting as, as, as a matrix. So you have a matrix with, with m rows and n columns, a 0, 1 matrix, and you consider k columns of that matrix. Now you see, you see a bunch of vectors. Uh, of length k, how many, how many of them are distinct? So it turns out that there is always at least m times n, square root of n times n uh, distinct projections for some clever choice of a set of coordinates to project on. And assuming that m is sub-exponential, this is what I, our proof gave, and k is not uh, too small, and as it turns out, this is best possible. So there is a construction of a, f of a set of binary vectors which shows that you can't get anything better than this bound. So if you, wh whenever, I don't know, projections of vectors come up in your uh, research, maybe try to use something like that. Um, okay, and one last statement that I want to mention in a, a somewhat older uh, uh, work with, uh, again, together with Asaf Shapiro, my PhD advisor, it says the following, fix your favorite uh, uh, three variable function. F turns out that every sequence has a subsequence uh, uh, where f is consecutive on uh, sorry where f is constant on every consecutive tip triple. So this provided the length of the uh, so every sequence of length n as a subsequence of length k, which is which satisfies this property provided n is sufficiently large in terms of k. I will I will immediately say what in a second say what how how large n must be, but this should remind some of you of something from maybe undergrad. Uh, 
suppose that f only depends on two variables, x and, uh, x and y. Specifically, f is the function which returns one value if x is larger than y and another value if x is smaller than y. In that case, this statement guarantees that every sequence of numbers has a subsequence which is either decreasing or increasing. So that's the famous erdos sekeresh theorem. Sorry. Um, and, and, um, but for three variables, uh, this is what you get. The correct bound for three variables is P sub dk, which is in the notation for the number of d-dimensional partitions of size k, where the dimension is the size of the image of f minus one. So what are, what are for example, for d equals two, what is the two-dimensional partition? That's a well-studied notion going back 100 years ago, at least. Uh, so a two-dimensional partition uh, of size k is a k by k matrices, k by k matrix, with entries which are numbers between the integer numbers between uh, zero and k, where in every row and every column, uh, the numbers do not increase, can only decrease. Um, it has multiple other formulations. Um, so apparently if n, if your length of the sequence is larger than this number, then you got this subsequence, and it turns out that this is tight. This is best possible. So if n is not strictly larger than pd of k, then this, is, this statement is actually not true. So this is a characterization. And because this notion was studied, uh, the notion of the high dimensional partitions was studied uh, so long ago, we have some results for it. For example, we have a very, a very nice closed formula for the two dimension, for the number of these matrices. Uh, here is this formula proved by McMahon more than, uh, so at the end of the 19th century. And, um, and in particular, it gives a very neat uh, asymptotic formula for the d-dimensional case, for d greater than two, so it, it is not too hard to, to give, uh, to show that it's basically a constant times two k to the d, where this constant depends on this somehow, we don't know quite how, uh, and that's also an open question, uh, which I will be interested to know uh, more about. So yeah, I'll stop here.